When WWE is good, it is great. When it's bad, it can actually be better. And when it's a train wreck, you cannot look away, regardless of how horrifyingly bad it may be. The perils of live television mixed with dodgy creative has led to some train wreck segments that will continue to live in infamy, with them often pointed at as nadirs for shows, wrestlers, and even the whole company. Of course, bad as they are, they are still ripe for roasting, and so join me as we have a laugh at times sports entertainment went completely off the rails. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest WWE train wreck segments. Choo choo. Number 10, The Old Day. WWE signing of Carl Anderson and Doc Gallows, two big bald bruisers, well, one big bald bruiser and one bald bruiser who had been tearing it up in New Japan for years, was met with much enthusiasm from Grapple fans. It didn't take too long, however, for those same fans to realize that the company probably didn't know what the hell to do with them. Their WWE run overall turned out to be a huge disappointment, with a few standout matches to their credit, but plenty of badly written segments and promos. The worst of the bunch was the horrendous bit where they introduced the old day, which was you know, people pretending to be the new day, but, well, old. Genius. The Good Brothers tried, bless them, but the premise was corny and the dialogue the impersonators were given was just brutally unfunny. It dragged on and on and on to the sound of much groaning from the live audience until Kofi, Woods, and Big E made their way out and beat up their aged avatars. The Machine Gun himself even went on Twitter afterwards and essentially admitted the segment was terrible. Number 9. The Ball Boys on Miz TV Whenever you get celebrities involved in a sports entertainment setting, you do so in the knowledge that it could turn out to be anything from quite good to an absolute abomination against nature. For it to work, they need to have some understanding of wrestling as a genre, or at least be aware of the product, and really, they need to prepare for being in such a unique environment. When former basketball great and zany entrepreneur LeVar Ball appeared on Raw to promote an endeavor on Miz TV, he said F that S to reading the script and and F you in the A to the Miz too. I mean, he probably didn't say those exact words, but he certainly didn't do his due diligence before going out on live TV in front of an audience of millions. He winged it, and it was a disaster. Highlights included that weird run he did, failing to slide under the bottom rope, randomly ripping his shirt off and posing, one of his kids uttering a racial slur. Just classic, classic stuff. All the hits. Dean Ambrose was even sent out early to try and save the segment, but the damage was done and it was unsavable. Number 8. Hillary vs. Obama WWE and politics, a combination of things as welcome as cigarette butts on a nice fresh pizza. Vince McMahon's company simply can't help but get involved in politics, whether it's with things like the Smackdown Your Vote campaign or, you know, Linda McMahon being part of Donald Trump's actual cabinet staff. In April 2008, WWE decided to do something topical in the run-up to the presidential election. They not only had Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and John McCain address fans with speeches full of shoehorned-in wrestling references, but they also had Clinton and Obama wrestle live on Raw. Not the actual people, of course, because that would be mental, but rather two bad impersonators, with a bad Bill Clinton impersonator there, by the way, as a nice little unwanted bonus. Hillary cut a Hulk Hogan-style promo and did some posing as she belittled her husband, while fake ear sporting Obama did the rocks catchphrases. Then the bell rang and they had their woeful match, before Umaga mercifully came out and destroyed the pair of them, instantly turning him into the biggest babyface in the company. The Samoan bulldozer certainly gets my vote. Number 7. Meet the Lashleys how do you screw up a guy like Bobby Lashley? He has credibility, tenure, talent, and comes across as one of the most intimidating blokes on the planet. Despite having all the tools to make money as a serious ass kicker, WWE felt compelled to tweak the Dominator's character, resulting in some downright rotten television that did almost irreparable damage to his aura. His love triangle with Lana and Rusev was a blunder, but nothing compared to the segment where Sami Zayn introduced the world to Big Bob's sisters. Talk about trying to cut a guy off at the knees. The sisters were, naturally, three guys dressed in drag, one of whom had a moustache. The concept was trash, the verbiage somehow worse, and it made everyone involved look like a Muppet. 
Lashley eventually came out and put a stop to the pain, but even the brawl between him and his phony siblings was bad and didn't elicit many cheers from a crowd who was still reeling from what they'd just been forced to sit through. You know what? I somehow think that putting him in a suit, making him champion, and having him routinely wreck people was a little bit of a better use of the man. Number 6. 3 Minutes for HLA the Attitude Era was over by the fall of 2002, but WWE was still trying to be edgy in order to capture an audience that had basically switched off following the bungled Invasion storyline. This reliance on shock TV in order to generate interest was at its worst on Monday Night Raw, with some truly terrible storylines and segments polluting WWE's flagship. One of the worst things the company did during that time was inflict HLA on the world. HLA was the kayfabe brainchild of Raw General Manager Eric Bischoff, though I think it was the actual brainchild of an actual child, and was basically a way to get girls to kiss each other. Howard Stern, eat your heart out. During the segment, the Bish played sleazy director as the ladies stripped to their knickers and started to fondle one another, while Jerry Lawler hyperventilated on commentary. Before the girls could get fully starkers, Bischoff informed them that their three minutes were up. Cue for three minute warning duo Rosie and Jamal to cut them off in horrific fashion. The titillation was crass, but the beating the women received after was uncomfortable to watch. Number 5. Bailey, This Is Your Life In 1999, The Rock and Mick Foley were involved in one of the most legendary segments in Raw's history, as Mankind presented his Rock and Sock Connection partner with This Is Your Life. It was a rating smash, even though as a segment, it's one of those things that's better in your memory than it actually was, because it went on forever and was carried only by the charisma of the Great One and Mrs. Foley's baby boy. They rehashed it five years later with the roles reversed, and that was fine, but WWE went to the well once too often when they attempted another This Is Your Life segment in 2017. This time, Alexa Bliss was the one hosting, and oh boy, was it Fifty Shades of Dreadful. Bailey was the one being sent up on this occasion as Little Miss Bliss made fun of the hugger's supposedly pathetic childhood, interviewing Bailey's old teacher as well as her former best friend and boyfriend, who, Kel Surprise, ended up hooking up. Capping off the train wreck, Bailey ran in to run Bliss off, only to be beaten up herself because modern WWE babyfaces are all hopeless idiots. Number 4. The Big Dog and the Beanstalk How great has it been to see Roman Reigns finally, finally find his voice and hit his stride after years of bad booking and the audience refusing to accept him as the hero WWE were desperate for him to be? As the head of the table, he is one of, if not the best all-around performer in the company, and maybe the entire business. It's a testament to Reigns that he managed to persevere, because a lesser talent wouldn't have survived some of the things he was forced to overcome. In January 2015, Reigns gave one of the worst promos ever when he retold Jack and the Beanstalk via a long, rambling monologue aimed at the big show, Magic Beans and All. It started out bad and got progressively worse before falling off a cliff and ending with the crowd showering the big dog with booze. Is it any wonder that, weeks later, the fans in attendance at the Royal Rumble pay-per-view so viciously turned on him after he won the match? Roman is at his best when playing the strong, silent type who does his talking in the ring, not awkwardly reciting fairy tales. Number 3. Donald Trump vs. Rosie O'Donnell WWE's business model is pretty simple when you think about it. Create conflict between characters, build up their rivalry, and then put them in the ring. Celebrities Donald Trump and Rosie O'Donnell had done half the work for them when WWE decided to book them in a match live on Raw in early 2007. Only it wasn't actually them, was it? It was two really bad imposters as WWE tried their hand at topical humour once again, never ends well, with this shameless publicity stunt. Clearly done for an audience of very very few, if not one person who was sitting at ringside watching the whole thing, the match was an unfunny shambles that never seemed to end. There were lots of hilarious references to O'Donnell's sexual orientation as she was introduced as the left-leaning lesbian, while Jim Ross, probably wishing he was back working for Bill Watts, commented on her lesbianic fury. The match, if you want to call it that, obviously wasn't entertaining in the slightest and played before a mixture of jeers and stone-faced silence. It ended with the Don winning thanks to the classic birthday cake to the face and I simply have to say, Vince McMahon, you better give me those 10 minutes of my life back or so help you God! Number 2. Dr. Heine 
Ah, speaking of Vince McMahon owing me some of my life back, let's talk about Dr. Heine, shall we? Yeah, I mean, why not? It's such a nice, fun thing to talk about, isn't it? Right, so Jim Ross had to leave WWE for a bit due to health issues that required him to undergo colon surgery. Also, Vince McMahon was cold on him and wanted to replace him with someone new anyway. As a nice little going away present, Vince had him fired in the middle of the ring, complete with Linda McMahon kicking the man in the black hat right in the slobber knackers. While JR was convalescing at home, he got to watch on as his boss dressed up as the inimitable Dr. Heine and performed his own brand of slapstick surgery on a dummy made made to look like his lead announcer. The genetic jackhammer, accompanied by a buxom nurse, pulled all manner of objects out of JR's backside, including a football, a Stone Cold Steve Austin doll, an owl for some reason, and finally, his own head. You see, Ross simply had to pull his head out of his ass. That was his problem. That was the joke. Kill me. Number one, Katie Vick. Somewhat surpassing Dr. Heine in the bad taste stakes is Katie Vick, another lower than lowbrow attempt to edgy sub-toilet humor entertainment that a man with the initials VKM purportedly thought was the funniest thing in the whole damn world. To recap, Triple H revealed that Kane was once responsible for the accidental vehicular homicide of his high school sweetheart Katie Vick. I'm guessing his mask caused him issues while driving. This led to the game taunting the big red machine as they geared up for a world heavyweight title showdown by doing what any decent heel would do and showing up at a funeral home, dressed in a cane mask and pretending to have his way with Katie Vick's remains. It was... how best to describe it? It was like when you turn the TV on and happen to stumble across the worst thing you've ever seen in your entire life. But hey, at least Kane ended up losing the feud and his intercontinental title while gaining no significant measure of revenge for the painful humiliation. So it all worked out in the end, didn't it?